So uh, let's just get started here. Um, my name is Amit Bhattacharya. I teach in the master's program in data analytics at uh, the School of Professional Studies, and um, and that's kind of a part-time gig for me. I also work as a data scientist professionally at a company called Teachers Pay Teachers. And uh, today we're going to talk about how to kind of use like you know, a simple machine learning algorithm to do something that I think we would all like to do, which is to win like a fantasy league or a confidence pool or something like that that you do with your friends. And hopefully we'll try to see like a little bit of uh, examples of how you might analyze your data and use like some of the techniques that we hear about all the time, you know, that data scientists use on a daily basis. Um, and then the other thing I just thought I'd mention is this work is done in conjunction with another person who's also on the faculty at uh, the School of Professional Studies, and um, he and I have worked on this algorithm together, and we have a lot of fun with it. Um, so, you know, just um, let's just kind of start off with uh, something a little funny. Um, I think we all, uh, you know, there's like a general saying that, uh, you know, uh, especially with football, that anything can happen on any given Sunday. Um, John Gruden is one of the ABC analysts for Monday Night Football, and so he's always got like a funny quote or two. But it really just shows, you know, what we all kind of know about football. Like, despite what the spreads are, despite who's favored, despite who's good, who's bad, like, still, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in football. And that's part of, like, I think why we all watch it and why it's all fun. Um, okay, so let's just get started. Like, um, you know, there's lots of different kinds of fantasy football leagues. Um, we're going to talk about a very specific one called a, a confidence league or a pick'em league. Um, but you know, just in general, like don't, you know, when you're a sports fan, you feel like you're you're better at you know what's going on, you know what's going to happen. You can call better plays than the coach, this and that. Um, also, you know, everybody's you know, we all watch enough sports shows, highlights before, highlights after, you know, and there's all these people that are getting paid to like make predictions, and you know, are they really any better or worse than you know anybody else? And then also, you know, the other, like, piece of information that we have is, you know, the point spreads. So the point spreads are basically, um, if people aren't familiar with, in the, in the gambling world, basically one team is favored to win over another one based on any variety of factors. And, you know, how good are these point spreads? You know, how good is Las Vegas and how good is the betting world at predicting, you know, who's going to win and who's going to lose? And, you know, to be honest, like, it's not bad because, you know, that it might represent like the wisdom of the masses or just like a general, you know, like marketplace um, impression of what's going to happen. And it may not be 100% correct, but you could argue that statistically it might be the best guess. So these point spreads that, you know, that you get, you know, you can go online, you can go read the newspaper. Um, if you actually wanted to make, bet money, you would have to take these things into account. You know, they're the simplest, you know, what I'm calling the simplest and best place for winning one of these uh, simple leagues. And I'll, I'll describe like the Pick'em League in a little bit more detail. Um, and what we're trying to do is saying like, okay, if that's like the simplest, best place to start, and then we use like a machine learning algorithm to predict outcomes, then can we show steady and consistent improvement or can we not? And just to also keep in mind, this is a research in um, sort of uh, in progress. We don't necessarily know the right answer, but it does show like how if you had a project and you had some data how you might try to go about starting to analyze it. Whoops. Okay, so how does this fantasy league work? So in a pick'em fantasy league, there's no you don't pick players, you don't like uh, compete against each other. Basically, what you're doing is you're every week there's 16 games, maybe some some weeks there's like a few fewer because of the bye weeks and the scheduling for the league. But um, you're supposed to pick the outright winners and then rank them 1 through 16 based on which one you have more confidence in. And so basically you rank 16 points to the highest team that you think is going to win and then 15, 14, so on, down to 1. And then the way you accumulate points is by guessing correctly. So if I had picked um, a certain team to win and I ranked them with 16 points, and if they actually ended up winning, I would get 16 points. And if they lost, then I would get 0 points. And in the end, you know, on a weekly basis, somebody wins the week based on who's got the most points that week. And then the way our league works is the person who wins the entire league is the person who's accumulated the most number of correct picks associated with points over the entire season. And then, and just as you might imagine, like winning anything over the season involves consistency. So, you know, some people like have the strategy that I'm just going to go and pick like the craziest upsets and try to like win one week. 
but other people have the idea that they want to win the entire season, and so then, then you have to be pretty consistent. You have to basically not overweight upsets. You have to more or less guess with what most people are guessing and try to make some like small corrections along the way. So now, what, what, how does this actually look in real life? So this is like uh, the fantasy league that we actually participate in. It's run through CBS, but I think there's like any number of places where you could uh, you could do this kind of league. So you can see here, this was a, this is a while ago. It's actually not this week, um, but you can see what happens is you you pick in this case Indianapolis to beat Jacksonville, Philadelphia to beat Tennessee, and then you rank them by like dragging these like things up and down and you know, the percentages here just show like what other people are doing, but you can pick anything you want. You can go against the wisdom, you can go with the wisdom, you can uh, go against the spread, you can go with the home team, away team. Um, it's totally up to you which team you want to pick, and it's totally up to you which, uh, how you want to rank yourself. So let's uh, go on to the next one. Um, right, so what might be like some strategies if you were going to uh, start picking uh, these teams, right? So what I started off saying is that the betting world already provides like a view on like the likelihood that a particular team is going to win, right? So one really simple strategy is to just pick purely by the spread. So if in this coming week it says that like, or last week for example, Green Bay was favored by like eight or nine points to win at home, like, and that was the team that had the highest point spread, I would pick them the highest. And then I would just rank which teams were favored by how much, and I would literally just pick according to the spread. Um, so that's like one strategy. Um, let's think about some other strategies, right, based on any number of other factors, right? Um, you could look at the win-loss records of the teams. You could look at the strength of schedule of various teams, because often you, if you played a much harder schedule, you could be a better team but might have lost because you played harder teams. You could take into account whether the game is home or away. You could take into account um, whether it's in a division or non-division game. So in the NFL, for example, the teams are broken into four, two separate leagues and four divisions within those leagues, and you play each team in your division twice a year, whereas the other teams you may or may not play throughout the season. So division opponents usually have a much higher familiarity with each other. They have, usually have like a long-standing rivalry, like the Chicago Bears have been playing the Detroit Lions twice a year for like a hundred years, and so th there's like a rivalry, there's even some animosity potentially. Um, also, there's injury reports. And then just personal preference and intuition. Sometimes you just think that something is going to happen. Sometimes you like certain players, sometimes you really dislike other players, or you know, you might just be from New York and always pick the Giants because you know, that might be an irrational preference, but it's still a preference. So what I one way to think about it is the point spread that is being provided from the betting world is might encapsulate all of these things into a single number, but it might not. It might not actually incorporate everything that you know you think is important, and which is why you might try to go away from the point spread strategy. So let's see what happens if you actually use the point spread strategy. So this is actually um, uh, the final outcomes from a particular year. This was in 2008. I've been playing this uh, with my brother-in-law and a bunch of friends for a very long time. Um, and this is, at the beginning, I actually used to do it, you know, just like I said, using this ad hoc strategy. Um, I more or less followed the spread strategy, but I would make some tweaks based on some personal intuition on a weekly basis. And in this particular year, like I happened to have won the league, and if I had just followed the spread strategy, which is like just take the numbers and rank according to the spreads, um, I still would have won. I would have won by 11 points this year. But, you know, the, maybe that's just uh, I got lucky or maybe, you know, maybe that's like I'm amazing at this. I doubt I'm amazing at this. But um, the one thing I was thinking all the years that I was picking, you know, just, you know, by hand, picking with intuition, I thought like, you know, every year I more or less do the same thing. I start with the spreads and then I make some small adjustments based on like an internal algorithm. Like why don't I get the computer to do this and take out the sort of emotion that I feel like week over week, and maybe I have some biases against certain teams or players, or you know, this it's unavoidable. Maybe even I picked 
according to the spread, like three weeks in a row, some team, and then they disappointed me three times in a row, I might be like tempted to like lower them in the rankings the following week. And so I just wanted to take the emotion out of it, which is why part of why we came up with this strategy of like letting the computer do some of the picking. All right. So next, like let's see like how how does a spread strategy actually work? Let, uh, just a really simple back testing. So you know here we. We have um, six years that we analyzed, 2008 through 2013 seasons, and in three of the years, the spread strategy actually won. Just, you know, nobody in the entire league did, did better than the spread strategy. So you can kind of say that, like, hey, that's not a pretty, that's not a bad strategy. The spread strategy does pretty good because, you know, half the time you're winning the league, probably the other half the time you're kind of, you know, pretty high up in the standings. Um, you can see the red years are the years where the spread strategy lost to somebody who was picking not on the spread strategy, presumably. Um, I highlighted 2008. That's the year that where one person, well, and me in this case, happened to have like beat the spread strategy by a larger than average margin. But you know, like, who's to say like I did a fantastic job or not? We want sort of like something repeatable, something that the computer is like spitting out some answers. So let's see what happens if we can do better. Or, and ideally, can the computer win every year? Because that, that's ideally what we would like. All right, so now we are kind of just going to go into a little bit of uh, math. Uh, not, nothing hard. There hopefully won't be any equations that pop up and scare anybody. Um, so just we'll talk a little bit about the – in machine learning, we use a technique called logistic regression. But before we get into logistic regression, just thought I would you know, mention the other kind of regression that we're all familiar with, which is linear regression. Linear regression is basically designed to estimate one value based on, you know, another value. So, like, in this case, you know, you have, like, a xy coordinate plane, and you see that you have this scatter plot of points, and you more or less can see there's, like, a general trend, you know, of a straight line that goes through those. And so for any given x value, I can guess what y should be, or even the other way around. If for any given y value, I can just look up, according to the red line, what x should be. And so this is like, you know, a linear model. And so let's see how that compares to a logistic regression model. So log logistic regression is more for classification. Not so much predicting a particular value, like between 1 and 100, but in this case, you know, is something good or bad? Or in my case, I want to know whether a team wins or loses, or who I should pick, you know, the favorite or the underdog. So the important thing to remember about machine learning and logistic regression is that what happens is you train your model. You give the computer a bunch of examples of what's right and what's wrong and all the parameters that you know about it, and then you train a model, and then you give it data that it hasn't seen before, and you ask it to decide. Based on the previous data, what would you guess for this? So here's like a, you know, a simple example where we have you know, people who took two tests, you know, exam one and exam two, and maybe this was like the admission criteria to get into some college, and it turns out that you know if you draw this straight line, which is the blue line, that's not predicting a particular value. That's just what's called the decision boundary, meaning that if you're on one side of the line, you're more likely to be admitted. If you're on the other side of the line, you're less likely to be admitted. And you can see it's not perfect either. There are some people that are quote unquote misclassified, but you know that's okay because there's no there's not necessarily a perfect model that's going to get it right every time. The whole idea with machine learning and logistic regression is you try to fit the model in the best possible way to the data you have so that you can like make decisions that you think are probably correct more often than not, which is exactly what we want for our league as well. Like We're not necessarily looking to guess every single one correctly, and we know we're never going to do that. We just have to do a little bit better than the spread method in order to win the league every year. And, and here's a little bit of um, just, you know, how does the underneath logistic regression work? Um, there's a function called the sigmoid function, which helps mathematically pick between things that are 0 and 1. So you can see that as you go towards negative numbers, the sigmoid function is very, very close to 0. As you go towards high positive numbers, it's very, very close to 1. And so this is what's called a binary classifier, because it's helping us decide, you know, mathematically between 0 and 1. And also, like you can see right in the middle when you're at uh, the value of 0, the probability is 50%. So that means that you're neither 0 or 1. The other nice thing about using logistic regression and this sigmoid function is that it returns a probability. Because in the end, not only does my model need to tell me which team to pick, I also have to rank them. I have to figure out which 
team is more probable to win and which team is less probable to win. Because I want to put 16 points on the team that I think is the most probable to win and rank them accordingly. So this logistic regression and the sigmoid function also gives me like the ability to like do the ranking that I want to see in the final output. All right, so how does logistic regression work? Just a little bit of like terminology um, and then just uh, relating it to the problem that we have at hand. So in any logistic regression, you have some number of inputs, which are called features, and then you have a single output, which is your binary classifier. And so that's like a one or a zero. And in this case, you have to interpret the one or the zero to exactly what you want to do. And so in, in my case, I have to figure out what are the relevant features, which we'll talk about in just a second. And then we have to carefully uh, think about like when I get this output for one or zero, um, what does it actually mean? Like, did I, what did I predict? And so in our case, we're gonna the way that I've set up the problem and the way that I've input the data, the thing that I'm trying to predict is did the favored team win? So I, I put in the the teams and which what their names are, and I put in like the the spread basically. So the spread tells you immediately like which team is favored and so I run the model to see if like given that a team was favored did it actually end up winning. So let's just see if we can uh, see um, how would we actually do this in real life. So we've kind of uh, come to the point where you know we've described the problem, we have a great idea, but we actually have to get the computer to do all this. So um, this, uh, this code is written 100% in Python uh, Python is, you know, a fantastic language for doing data science work. There's other good languages out there as well, um, but, you know, Python has a lot of packages built in, and so there's a particular package out there called Scikit-Learn. It's an open source package. It has a lot of implementations of machine learning algorithms, and in particular, it has a very good one for logistic regression. And you can see, um, this is like just a snapshot of some code, and it's not meant to be, um, it, it really is like this simple. You define a model in the first line, and then the next model, you fit the model with your x's and y's. In this case, the x's are the features, and y are the classifiers, the, the right answer, 0 and 1. So this is where it's like training the model. Next, you, uh, you can get the accuracy score to see like how, you know, how you did, like to see like, oh, is it training like all the time, 100%? Is it you know, does it get it zero percent of the time? So you can compute the accuracy of your model, and then when you want to estimate, when you want to predict what's going to happen to stuff you haven't seen before, you predict something. So you take your model and you predict what you think is going to happen, and that's your final answer. It tells you, you know, what to go put into the computer for this coming week. So um, and then. And then how do we actually implement like, this Python code? So I'm not sure how, how many people are familiar, but there's like a very nice uh, web-based interface to Python where you can like run, run Python code in an interactive way and um, you can like step-by-step -step see like the results of your work and it's a very good like scratch pad for doing work and like doing some research and it's also a nice you know, environment to present work as well, especially like research work like this. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to switch over a little bit to um, the Python to see like how this actually happens in real life, and um, hopefully um, we'll get a, a flavor for how it actually works. So we're going to switch over to the this a Python notebook. Uh, the other one of the other benefits of the notebook is um, you can intersperse, you know, commentary, comments, pictures. Um, web links in a way that like makes it like much more readable than just like usually looking at a programmer's um, code. All right, so what I've tried to do is like tried to put a little few comments at the top of each block so we can like know what we're doing. Um, not all of them are completely necessary to understand like the nitty gritty, but we'll just go through it like very very quickly and see if uh, we can um, see like how this actually works. And I'm not going to try to run it right now because I'm sure if I try to run something live it would like break and it would be a disaster. So this has been pre-run, you know, sort of like a cooking show. All the vegetables have been chopped up and the stuff magically goes in the oven for a couple hours and comes back out ready to eat and it's very tasty. So the very first thing we're going to do is like, you know, we're going to set up our directories. We're just going to, you know, tell the program where to find relevant data. Um, here, warnings control, just to make sure that, you know, we get enough warnings when we're actually programming. Here is like where you import 
uh, most of the modules that you need. So you can see here, the one we're going to be using the most is the linear model from the Scikit's Learn package. Um, th these are a bunch of like standard packages that are uh, more or less used by a lot of people. And then, you know, the one that we wrote custom for this particular uh, exercise is called Madden, after our one of the famous football coaches and commentators. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to look up, um, look up, get a bunch of data, just like from the teams and seasons and like historical records. The next thing we're going to, and here you can see like when you actually pull some data in, you have a, the ability in IPython to actually visualize it as well. So here, this is a very simple output of, you know, the names of the teams, which leagues they, they're in, and which division they're in. This is actually very important because, um, you know, we need to know whether two teams played in the same division or not for a particular game, because that's one of the key inputs or features in our model. All right. So, and then here, we set up the, the training. So, again, with um, machine learning and especially logistic regression, the whole point is to... Um, train the model on some known outcomes. So here what we do is we, we're going we're gonna to try to produce outcomes for 2015, which is the current season, but we want to test on the pre three previous years. And so, you know, despite all this like Python code, you can see that for 2015, the training was done on the years 2012, 13, and 14. And, and we've done a little bit of testing to see if like what kind of window we want to use for training the model and we decided that three years was a good robust data set without going so far back that you know you're mixing in when certain teams were not good or whatever. Um, so the next thing we do, um, this is where we just like literally like read in all the data uh, because you know I have in a separate CSV file somewhere um, every single outcome of those years of 2012, 2013, 2014, exactly who played who, what the final score was, and what was the initial um, line leading up to that game, like right before the game was played. Um, so then, and you can see here, like this is what all games looks like. All games is like a variable where it has literally from, you can see here, the Dallas Cowboys played New York Giants, and the final score was 24 to 17. It turned out that in this one, the it probably the Cowboys were favored, and then you know there's a lot of like l things that are computed in terms of uh, the things that the model needs, and and we'll get into like oh actually I, the very next uh, section shows like what are the different independent variables that I'm using in my logistic regression. So I kind of alluded to this before, but you could imagine when you're doing a model that and you're deciding like which team is going to win, you're going to want the record of the favored team, you're going to want the current record of the underdog team. In this case, I have two other variables, which are previous favorite record and previous underdog record. Those are the, your record from last year. So this is particularly useful when, you know, early in the season, you know, the only zero or one games have been played. Like, how do you know which teams are any good? Like, they don't have any record to go on. So therefore, you can use previous year's record to, like, help you decide you know, which teams were good. And, you know, things don't change that quickly in the NFL because, you know, last year's Super Bowl winner probably won like 4, 13 or 14 games. And so early in the season, you would expect them to have the advantage over other teams that might not have won that many games. Um, there's another variable called game week. So that's the week in the season. So our favorite, I put this in in particular because the favorite record and the underdog record, are those are in percentages. And so if you won 100% of your games, um, it's, it's a good thing to know, but winning 100% of your games one week through the season is much different than winning 100% of your games 10 weeks through the season. Clearly, a 10-0 team is much better, like, stronger and should be more favored than just a 1-0 team. So that's what game week is for. Um, absolute line, that's the actual point spread that there's an input. Um, in this case, it's... Uh, entered as an absolute value because we already have the knowledge of which team is home, which one's away, and which we have some variables that already keep track of which teams are favored and and not. Um, the division game, this is the this is basically the one um, feature that I really think makes a big difference, which is why when I wrote the model that um, really wanted to include this in in the feature set. So the division game again is like teams that you're playing inside the division and they're usually more competitive and then the theory is and this is something that I, especially football fans will know this 
is that there, there could be two teams. Let, let's say the Green Bay Packers are particularly good and they're playing the Chicago Bears, which are particularly bad this year. Uh, and on average, like if the point spread says that Green Bay is going to win by a lot, you're, you're going to believe that. But if that division game is at home, they're... After watching football all these years, I've noticed that somehow Chicago has a much higher chance of winning these division games at home. They're much, much more competitive because they're rivalry games and because they have like so much familiarity with each other, they tend to play much, much better than they otherwise would. And so the thing is, like, I have this like bias, and so I put it in as a feature to see if like it would make a difference or not. If in the end it's like not a feature that is relevant, the model will like, not really um, account for it much. But if it does think it's an important feature, it will like weight it as one of the factors. Um, and then the same thing is like the favored home game. This is just a true-false um, output uh, input because in the end we want to figure out did the favored team win or not, so we needed to know if the, if the team was favored in their home game or not. Okay, so, and then just like I said before, like this is pretty easy to set up. Like, you just define a classifier, and so we put together a little bit of structure around this, but you know, basically you create a linear model, and in this case we're using the logistic regression, and then you know, our code basically takes that classifier, and it takes all the games and all the features, and it creates what we're calling a classifier. And then we use the output of that classifier to test for any, for any particular week if we want the output. So here what we're doing is we're predicting a particular week of the current season. The upcoming week is week seven, and so we've actually run this to see like what does the computer say about upcoming week. And so you can see here like even though there's like a little bit of uh, you know code like read all games, get the season records, uh, process games, all it does is figure out you know who's home, who's away, were they like division opponents or not. Um, this is just a little bit of logistics, but the actual predicting is very straightforward. You just um, you give it the test the test games, which are like the games that are coming up, and you give it the classifier, and you give it the features, and it will predict for you the zero and one is that like is the home team gonna the gonna win or not, or is the favored team gonna win or not. So here you can see like what it looks like. This is the upcoming week. Um, the Seattle Seahawks are supposed to play the 49ers, and the Seahawks are favored by six. The Buffalo Bills are supposed to play Jacksonville. Uh, I think uh, Buffalo is favored here. So anyways, um, this is what the input is, and then we can see what the output is. After I run the model and I display the weekly ranking, I, uh, this is what it says. So it turns out that New England is favored by nine this week, and the, the model also picks up that it's you know the most favored team according to all the different factors and the probability of it, New England winning is 83%, and that's the highest percentage, so therefore it's going to get a number 16 ranking. And then, and this is all using the logistic regression model. There are other classifiers you can use, and we're uh, currently like sort of testing some of the other types of classifiers that are out there. Some of them that are very popular are called support vector machines. The other ones that um, you know Netflix uses is something called random forests. So there's a lot of different classifiers out there, and we're actually in the process of like testing these to see like if different classifiers are different. But in this case, we're just like going with this uh, linear reg regression model to see if it um, how, how it performs. It also gives like the sort of most intuitive results. So we're generally happier about this one for now. Um, and the other thing you can see here is that the way it's ranked the teams is not how it would be ranked if um, you had just gone straight according to the spread. And then the other thing is that you, you do also have like some amount of discretion as to um, exactly how to rank them. For example, um, this week every single favorite team has been picked to win. There's no underdogs that are picked. Because if the prediction probability had gone below 50%, that would have been a case where um, that's saying that the favored team has less than a 50% chance of winning, so that implies that the underdog team has a higher chance of winning. And so then we would see pr predict probabilities below 50%. And then it's not clear what is the right way to rank these teams in that case. Because you could say, you could still predict, you could always pick the favored team and just rank by this probability. Or you could actually say, like, well, the underdog is predicted to win, so therefore I'm going to actually pick them to win, but, 
but you're, it's still not clear where do you pick the underdog to win. Do you put them at? Do you put all the underdogs at the bottom because you're ranking them that way? Or let's say one of these prediction probabilities was zero, right? So that doesn't ever happen. But let's say the prediction probability for the favorite team was zero. That means there's a hundred percent chance that the underdog wins. So you might consider putting them at the very top of the list. So you do have some amount of um, discretion as to how to rank the different teams. So why don't we switch back to the um, to the presentation and we could look at like some of the different strategies um, of back testing. All right, so here what we have, let me just see is uh, right. So we did the all right, so here's the back testing that we did. So here what we show is the this was for a particular year. We took the training set to be 2013, and we took the test set to be uh, all the other years. Um, now that I look at it, the 2013 testing and training, uh, that's probably not a wise thing to do because you don't want to test your model on the same uh, data that you trained on. So we can just kind of ignore the second to last row here. Um, but so here we see in the spread strategy column the data that we've seen before. Like which years does a spread strategy win? And you can see like the three years, 2010, 11, and 13, the spread strategy would have won the league. And then these other three strategies are sort of back testing to see like how would we have done if we had used the logistic regression strategy. And the difference here is like between conservative, moderate, and aggressive exactly is what I was talking about is that in the conservative strategy you always pick the favorite team regardless of the probability and then you just rank by the probability of winning and so even if uh, the favorite team was supposed to lose by having like a probability of 30 percent we're still going to pick the favorite team because we're being more conservative and going along with what the conventional wisdom is we're just ranking them very low the moderately aggressive or the moderate strategy is where we pick the predicted team here we actually do allow the underdog to get picked every so often and we but we rank by the probability of, of winning so in this case we do pick some underdogs but the underdogs will always be at the bottom of the list and then the aggressive strategy is where we pick the predicted team so it could be the underdog or the favorite but then we take around the 50 percent number we we see how far you are from 50 percent so there's nothing stopping the underdog from being much much higher in the ranking list and then you can see what happens here is that um, if we compile these over the years the conservative strategy well we can see that the moderate strategy has the best outcomes and then also if you look at the standard deviation which is not shown here the moderate strategy also has like the lowest standard deviation so in going with like what we're gonna do we've picked the moderate strategy and because it shows like the highest performance as well as the lowest standard deviation. So all that being said, like there's no like definitive answer as to like you know when like if this thing is doing fantastic or not. We're in the middle of the season. Um, we're doing okay. Um, the spread strategy is actually doing really well this particular season. It's in second place in our league. And then the logistic regression model is a little bit further down in the rankings, but doing well overall. And the support vector machine. Uh, method is doing much much lower in the rankings and we're still trying to investigate as to why. So perhaps you're all thinking like well is this any good I just want to know what to what to pick this week right so here I've compiled the what we saw in the Python notebook um, and I just compiled basically the list of what are the outcomes for the current week and so this is actually something that I have to go and I have to input into my uh, into the fantasy program so that the picks get updated for the week but it's interesting to see like some of the results in this case the Patriots are favored by nine and it's kind of an overwhelmingly large number so both the spread rank and the regular ranking from the logistic regression model are the same but you can see that the Giants would have only been ranked like number seven according to the spread method but the model is saying 14 so it turns out that the Giants so this is exactly one of the features which is the division game feature is sort of at play here because the Giants are playing the Dallas Cowboys at home this weekend and according to the model it kind of gives them a little bit of extra weight to home division home games and because they're natural rivals because they play all the time and I think the Giants are actually doing better than the Cowboys this year although not much um, this the model is picking up 
to rate them a little bit higher. And so you can see that basically this week, even though it didn't pick any underdogs, there's like a reshuffling of the order from what you might otherwise pick if you had just picked completely according to the spread. So the spread rank is shown in the second to last column, and you can see like the differences in the ranking compared to the ranking column, which is ranked purely by the probability of winning in this particular week. So, um, so we have a bit of time. That's uh, pretty much like all I had. Um, I, hopefully, it's like interesting to you guys, and hopefully, it was um, you know kind of like a showing of how you might take some data that you have and a problem that you have, and um, to try to approach it with like a you know sort of a data science technique. And this is like not that different than what you know people do in the real world when they're faced with uh, data challenges at work. For example, I work at a company where we are trying to do recommendations for our users. And you know, like of course, it's not the exact same problem, but you know, every company is different. Not everyone, comp not every company has the resources of Amazon to do recommendations or like Netflix. And every single business is different. So I can't really because our website doesn't have like a functioning rating system, I couldn't even use Netflix's technology even if I wanted to because 99% of the way recommendations work at Netflix is using the rating system. Without a rating system, I have to like resort to other means of figuring out like how to, you know, look at my data, process my data. And so this type of like open-ended analysis where you're using machine learning tools and trying to figure out, you know, exactly what to do to solve your problems at work is very much, uh, you know, a very, you know, relevant thing. So there is like a, you know, a little bit of time for questions. Um, I see that uh, in the question and answer section, there's a, there's a couple uh, questions. Um, maybe I'll just uh, address them, you know, out loud since we have a little bit of time. So one person is asking, are there any differences in the strategy if we use a tool like R or MATLAB? So R and MATLAB are both like analytic tools. Um, R is favored usually among statisticians, and MATLAB is just like a general purpose tool um, for doing similar kinds of analysis. So I would say that if the logistic regression is a more or less like well understood um, you know, algorithm that has probably been implemented very, very similarly in R and MATLAB. So I would say you would, given the same exact numbers, you would get the same exact answers, but assuming the algorithms were the same. But if you, you know, input the features differently or make different choices as to like the, you know, some of the tuning parameters for your models, then you might get different answers. And um, I'm not, I haven't played with R or MATLAB, but I just imagine that you know something as like standard as like log logistic regression, which has been around for a while, you would more or less get the same answers. Um, Somebody's asked um, as well, like, how do we import the data? Is it manual or imported from certain websites? Um, so generally speaking, I uh, scrape some websites to get the data. So the historical data, I was able to get, like, a database that, that goes back all the way to, like, 2007. And actually, that was at the top of the, the notebook, if you guys remember. Um, if you go to this website where it says source of historical spreads and game scores, um, these people were actually keeping the data more or less consistent up until last year, and now they've kind of stopped for whatever reason. So initially I was able to backfill all my historical data using this website, but going forward, um, you can just go to like an ESPN site to get what games are going to be played, and then you can like, on a weekly basis, you can uh, go to a particular, you know, there's lots of places that show like the, what the lines are coming up for the coming week. So usually on Wednesday, which is today, the day before the first game is on Thursday night, we usually go and input the spreads. Um, and even though the we have a web scraper to like put in the numbers, um, we still kind of check by hand just to make sure that like there were no issues. Because even if like one of the numbers got in wrong, that would actually probably like mess up the predictions and the results, you know, for the following week. Um, yeah, so just like another person is also asking, was the data compiled from various sources or was it obtained from a single source? In this case, it was obtained from a single source, but this, the information I have is like, it's very standard. I think there's probably lots of different um, places where you could get this kind of just like historical outcomes. The only thing I really need 
is um, who played who, what the final score was, and what was the the spread going into that week. And that could probably be compiled from lots of different places. Um, and also, you can imagine that you know if this model was to be a little bit more sophisticated, there's lots of other features that you could include in the model, which we just haven't yet. But you know the model is rel supposed to be relatively simple and easy to understand, as well as you know have some predictive power. And but you can imagine there's a, like all sorts of uh, myths saying like oh Tampa Bay you know is not going to perform well playing Green Bay in the winter time. So it does like the start temperature of you know, the te of the game really matter. Or, you know, certain teams tend to play, you know, on natural grass compared to indoor artificial surfaces. Does that make a difference? You know, so those are all, like, pieces of data that I could potentially put into the model. That's not something that, you know, struck me as, like, a relevant piece of information to make, like, a, but those are certainly things that get talked about in terms of, like, what are other things that you could include in the model. Um. Um, so someone's also asking, is like, are you using um, pipelining and scikit-learn to clean and normalize your data? So I'm not using any of the the only parts of scikit-learn that I'm currently using on the data is to do the actual um, logistic regression. Um, all the other like cleaning of data is done beforehand. You know, like to look through the websites and to you know, turn the scores into who won, to turn like, you know, to look at the home, the names of the teams to figure out if they're in the right division or not, who's the home game, who's favored based on the line, whether it's positive or negative. All of that stuff is done in advance before sending off just the prediction part to uh, scikit-learn. Um, but I'm actually not all that aware of like those capabilities, so that might be something that, you know, we could definitely look into as we uh, try to like improve the process here. Um, all right, so let's see. How would you work with? Right. Okay. Yeah. So a bunch of. So yeah. There's a couple more questions here. So let me. Uh, now that I discovered them all, let me uh, address a couple of them. Um, so some people have. Someone's asking about overfitting and too many variables. Yeah. So this is actually a concern when you're doing data science work, and that is like you have a model and you think you've trained it really well, but in fact you can like overtrain your model. You can. You can. You lose predictive power when you get you know, beyond, you know, you add too many uh, variables and features to your model. So we have experimented a little bit on, like, you know, taking some, uh, like, the division game factor, for example. Like, you can take that out, and then you lose predictive power. And you put that back in, and it does increase your predictive power. So then that's, like, our sign that, you know, that one actually is, like, working. Um, so in the same way, what we try to do when we look at overfitting and too many variables is that, you um, not only do we have, sometimes in the training, you train on a certain amount of data, but then you hold out a little bit of your training data where you know the right answer, and you test on it to see if, like, it actually has the predictive power that you're hoping for. So that's a very good question. Um, someone just asked, like, about Python and, um, you know, different languages. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of different languages that get used in data science. Um, I think it got mentioned a little bit earlier, like R and MATLAB. And then Python, of course. Um, Python is, in the industry, one of the go-to languages. It's currently my favorite. So I tend to use Python when I'm teaching a course and when I'm doing my work. But that being said, there is like a time and a place for most other tools as well. Um, um, so someone is also asking, like, how much value is added by training over multiple years? Um, so that's a good question. Um, one of the values of training over multiple years is, like, let's say you're very early in the season and only one game has been played uh, and you're trying to train your model. Like, if you look back at previous year, let's say you only trained on one year. That means that you only have one week of data to look at and you're really, like, training your model based on, like, the idiosyncratic outcomes of that one particular week because, you know, the game of the week is also, or the, yeah, which week in the season you are is one of the features of the model. And so training over multiple years kind of, like, smooths out a little bit of idiosyncr idiosyncrasies in, like, the actual outcomes and hopefully gives you, like, a smoother signal. Uh, yeah, so someone is asking, like, more about, like, individual, like, fantasy football type picking, right? So in a regular fantasy league, you know, what happens is you have, like, you know, 10 players on your team, and then you're only starting, like, seven of them, and so you have to make a decision at the beginning of every individual week, like, who to start, 
who to sit, um, you know, should you make a trade, um, you know, who's doing well, who's not doing well. Um, I'm not aware of like source data for individual players, like personally, but I'm 100% sure that this is like out there because like there's so much stuff going on in this fantasy football world. Like there's got to be enough data. I think it's just a matter of, you know, you have to figure out exactly what it is you're trying to predict. I mean, in this case, it's probably pretty obvious. You're trying to predict who's got the most projected most number of fantasy points, but there's a lot of lot of you know extra features that would probably go into doing like an individual player league and something like this where you're looking you have a limited number of uh, inputs because there's only like I forget 32 teams and they're only playing like 16 games over the course of a season so this model I think is more uh, useful for like sort of like showing the capabilities of like a simple machine learning algorithm but I could imagine that if you could apply it to um, you know the individual fantasy leagues that would be really um, uh, that would be really powerful. Um, and oh yeah, so the code for this project is not currently available to all viewers, but we are looking to um, you know kind of put it into like a, a GitHub you know repository and then have it like available so people can kind of look to see how we're doing. But um, that's something that we're definitely uh, looking into in the next you know in a while. And um, Someone was asking just about what it meant with the negative, uh, the negative numbers and the spread columns. The positive and negative values just has to do with like whether it's the home team or not. Um, basically, like I think what if we go back to the, um, the presentation and we look at the final, uh, not that. We go back to, oops. Uh, it just ends the second I get to the last page, so I have to go more slowly. Okay, here we are. Yeah, so in this case, basically when it says um, a minus 4.5 for Atlanta, that means that Atlanta is a away team that's favored to win as opposed to the plus 9 for New England, which means it's a home team that's favored to win. So the only difference in the positive negatives is whether it's a, uh, a home game or an away game for the favored team. Um, but uh, like you guys saw, like in the in the features, we actually have like one variable just for the spread that's an absolute value number, and another variable to uh, tell it whether it's a home game or not. Um, right. So someone's asking more about um, like uh, data science as a general, and then, like how to like you know get good at this stuff. Like let's say you've taken a bunch of like standard math courses, and you um, you know you want to get more into this kind of stuff. Um, you know, so I would say, like, if you have, like, a standard um, familiarity with, like, statistics on um, probability and, you know, even, like, some calculus and algebra, like, I think you're fine. I would say, like, the main thing to try to do is if you're trying to get, to get up to speed on this stuff is, one, is you have to be familiar with, like, coding. That's just, like, kind of a standard literacy. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, you know, especially if you're going to be a little bit more technical and try to implement some of these algorithms, like a basic, like, machine learning course and, like, learning how to, like, implement some of these, like, algorithms is, like, the best way to kind of get up to speed. Because most of this stuff, you're not going to be doing, like, a ton of equation solving or math in itself. Most of it's what you're going to be doing is experimenting and trial and error and, like, really understanding your data and like knowing what is the right format your data has to be in in order to put into a model to get normal type answers out. If you just take a bunch of data and throw it into a model, the chances you get the right answer is very low. But if your data is like formatted properly in a way that the model understands and your, your final output, like in this case the classifier, is designed to actually predict something, then you can, you can do pretty well. So hopefully that was interesting and, um, you know, useful and give it a little flavor of uh, what kind of uh, analysis you can do with, like, a little bit of data and a little bit of uh, machine learning prowess. Um, if there's no more questions, I think uh, we'll uh, leave, it, leave it like that for today. <laughs>